Thank you everyone for joining me again. Dom Famulara here for the Artist Series, The Sessions at a Distance. This is so incredible. I get to talk to all these great musicians that in the course of the conversation, I am equally being inspired as I want you all to be inspired in this incredible journey of sharing of information. We have today, oh my gosh, I am such a fan of Tim's playing because the artist that he's played, the variety and the diversity of artists that he's played is pretty amazing. So I want you all to please welcome Mr. Tim Pierce. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. And yeah, your enthusiasm is pretty infectious. I'm, I already feel my energy level, level going up right right here right now. So <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully I can keep up with you. Well, Tim, listen, what I've heard you play on and what you've done and, and, and just the, the building of your career and just the, the high level of artistic expression you play, you know exactly what to play with the artist that you're playing, when to play it, and you just you have this innate talent to be able to deliver exactly what is needed at that moment. And that's something which is absolutely incredible. Well, that's something that I really reached for when I moved here because I realized, uh, you know, I could really make a living. I moved here in 1979 in, to L.A. and I became busy as a session player about 10 years later. I did a lot of great gigs and some great records in the 80s, but I really started the day-to-day -day work as a session player in around 1990. And I realized that a lot of guitar players approached it with, uh, you know, their guitar virtuosity at the forefront. And that's not really what people were needing. They needed orchestration, basically. And often that has to do with the simplest part and the simplest sound, the best part and the best sound. I worked with Trevor Horn for years, and he, he always used to say it's, you know, it's the simplest version of the best part or the best version of the simplest part. And that's kind of where I ended up. It was pure orchestration. And so I was a little different than some of the guys. I mean, everybody, a lot of guys did that well, but I really pushed that to the nth degree. I tried to make every song flower with, you know, special things that they were often very simple. And sometimes you didn't hear a lot of them. They were, they were subliminal. Some of them, some of them were like keyboard pads. Uh, some parts were super simple. So it was, it was orchestration. But what I'm impressed with Tim about yourself is that the, A, your humility, and your removal of the ego of your guitar part in the music. You play exactly what is needed, as little as might be needed. It might just be a, a simple chord change that you play at the right place, or it might be a little, a little lick that you play to lead into the aspect of, of what's more important for the song. Listen, that takes great discipline and self-control. Well, I, you're going to agree with, with, with me about a couple of things. I mean, I'm a super fan of Jimi Hendrix, Eric Clapton, Billy Gibbons, B.B. King, all the, you know, uh, David Gilmour, all the great guitar players that we loved from the 60s. But my real love of music, and I, I bet you'll agree with me, was Top 40 Radio in the 60s, which was uh, the eclectic, you know, it could have been Otis Redding, it could have been yeah. the Beatles, it could have been, you know, it's so many, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Yeah. My love of music, and all along the Watchtower was on the radio. I mean, Top 40 Radio was this amazing mix of everything, and it was all good. My love of music comes from songs. Mm. And the way that guitar would actually propel the song or function in the song or be used in the song. Now, of course... I became enamored with Hendrix and I thought that's what I want to be. That's what I want to do. And and even later when Steely Dan came along, I thought, oh, that's what I want to do. No, that's what I want to do. So I got, you know, I tried to be a guitar hero as much as I could. But really, my role was to do that some of the time in the background, working for other people. But man, my my love of music comes from the song. So it was in some ways... If you look at like five decades of guitar playing, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, you know, six decades maybe, and you think what are the best sounds and parts, the most iconic things that exist in those periods, all you have to do is is kind of pick from those things. Like, you know, Brian Setzer's an example. Maybe some song just needs a little bit of, you know, and that's all you do. And then maybe the next song needs somebody who's kind of, you know, riffing like Van Halen in the background. So you do that. So uh, all I'm saying is I would choose from all of the, you know, this whole palette of stuff that I'd heard these great parts and great songs over all the decades. And I would try and apply that to whatever was happening in the room. And the room might be an artist that knows nothing about, about music. That is one thing that I was a little better at. I have less patience for it now, but I was a little better. Well, I was a lot better at having an artist who knew nothing about music reject my parts and going, okay, 
what do you think, you know, and try two or three more things and then get it right. Because that, for some musicians, it's really hard <laughs> to have somebody who, maybe maybe a young person who's a really good singer, they don't know anything about music, and they ask for something in the wrong way, or they reject what you think is right, and you have to keep seeking. I was good at that. But that's really where the the unbelievable philosophy, you've got to go in there with this, this really, uh, you know, it's almost like a, like a wide palette of emotions to not be taking things personal to realize that you're there to provide what this person needs, whether they know what the heck they're talking about or not. <laughs> truth, truth. And you do take it personally. What I have said before, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of repeat it, is you have to bring your strong ego to the part because you've got to represent it and own it. And then you have to allow your ego to be obliterated yeah. when they reject it. And then you have to bring it back just as strong in the next few seconds with the new concept. And then eventually they fall in love with it. Now, the thing is, is that once you win people over, once you work with somebody, then it's easy. Then they kind of treat you the right way, you treat them the right way. But in the, on, a, on a first session with somebody new, if you win them over in the first half hour, whatever that takes, and you let them know that they can trust you to make their song sound better, yeah. Then, then you can start, you know, then they're more open to your ideas. So, But I think yeah. that's the common denominator that you have given to all these great artists, whether it's Joe Cocker, Michael Jackson, Phil Collins, Alice Cooper, my gosh, Kelly Clarkson, Rod Stewart, Bruce Springsteen. The common denominator is you have really given them just what was needed and you developed a high level of trust. That is, that is a key that, that that's where success really lies. Well, and it's ensemble playing. So the thing is, you know, you might do something on a record and it sounds glorious. And then when you hear that record six months later and it's being streamed, you hear it out in the world and you realize they turned your part down and you can barely hear it. That's something I had to get used to. But that's that's part of the process is just sublimating, you know, the glory of what you originally wanted to be as a guitar player and the glory of being in the moment in the session when they have it loud and they're loving your part and realizing that it's still going to be orchestration and it's still going to be part of a greater concept, which is the song and the singer. And if the song feels good at that moment and it, yeah. it, and it's right. Yeah no matter how it's mixed to a certain degree, and of course it has to be mixed well, but how it's mixed for your part, you made the song feel good at that moment to capture that, maybe your part was not up front all the way. So that, that, that's, listen, that's, that's really checking your ego at the door. That really is, that really is. I just, I, I didn't have any choice. I mean, this is the job I wanted to do. Yeah. And, and I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed getting in the room with all these people I never expected to even meet ever in my life. And I, I knew for me that was the way that that was the, that was my way in was to to really bend as much as I possibly could bend and, and shape and <laughs> try harder than everybody else, which you have done. So let's go back to Albuquerque, New Mexico. You're young in the 60s. You're listening to music. Tell me about about what got you involved in hearing music, playing music and what got you hooked into this business. Well, it's a pretty uh, magical place, the sky and the geography and the weather. There wasn't a lot of music in my family, but there were a lot of local bands playing. And I had a great guitar teacher for two years, and that was a real inspiration. I ended, ended up joining a, joining a band with him. I had a great guitar teacher from 12 to 14. But it really is, my sisters would have AM radio on all the time, and I literally would listen to songs on the radio, be in the backyard playing with my little trucks, you know, and I would listen to the Beatles like, you know, eight days a week or hard days night come on, and I literally would levitate. I, 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 it was so magical to me. I mean, one of the first memories I have, it might've been three was Petula Clark with downtown. That, <laughs> that song was like, every time I heard it, I, I was transported into some sort of other world. So I truly loved the music that was on the radio. And then uh, in the late sixties, uh, you know, I started looking at guitar gear and falling in love with, you know, amps and guitars and I got my first guitar at 12 and I was just off to the races obsessed. Now there were bars to play in, there were high school dances to play at, so I did all of that. I, I was a little bit of an entrepreneur. One New Year's I didn't have a gig so I called all these apartment complexes and got us a gig <laughs> at a party at an apartment complex because we didn't have a gig. Uh, and then at a certain point I realized I was 19. I realized, uh-oh, I can't stay here. 
I don't want to play in bars. There's no future if I don't leave. Right. And finally, I got brave enough uh, right before the age of 21 to drive out to L.A. And the lucky thing is, at the end of 1979, when I moved here, looking back at it, L.A. was actually a pretty nurturing place. And it was very inexpensive. It was all, or you know, there were no iPhones. There were no computers. There were studios. There were musicians. There were gigs. Yeah. And I would get gigs out of newspapers. I would get paid rehearsals. You could, you know, you could meet one musician and then that would introduce you to three more. Those three more would turn into nine more. Those nine more would turn into 81 more. Those 80, you know, see what I'm saying? It was just like a tree. So LA was actually, if you were decent, and I was not a great rhythm guitar player because I was so obsessed with lead guitar players at that point. It goes back to what we were talking about. That was when I was fully obsessed with you know Hendrix and and uh, Larry Carlton and lead players I kind of had to learn rhythm guitar on the job when I got here but LA was so open that you could kind of learn on the job you could meet people you could start hanging out and there was a certain point in the early 80s when I was able to keep $700 in my checking account and uh, and buy gear at the same time and I realized oh I think I'm actually getting by <laughs> and then I got a couple of big gigs I was 23 and I got Three things happened at the same time. I got, um, well, maybe two of them are notable, but I did, I went to New York and did John Waite's Ignition record that Neil Giraldo produced. And Neil Giraldo was like huge at that time because of Pat Benatar yeah. and a really, really respected guitar player. So he had me play guitar on that record in New York at the Power Station with Bob Clear Mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and at that moment, I met John Bon Jovi and he had me come do his demos. And that's how I ended up on the song Runaway, which was John's first hit. Yeah. Uh, and then I came back. And I had some friends who were working on Rick Springfield's record, a couple of roadies, and I snuck in and did a couple of parts on a new Rick Springfield record. And at that moment, he was arguably the biggest kind of star in America because he had the TV show and he had a number one with Jesse's Girl. So I did his second record. He auditioned me and I joined his band. So that gave me a gig that lasted five years in the 80s where I could tour. We toured the world. I did five Rick Springfield records. So I did. I had some initial success when I was 23 in the early 80s, and then I got the Rick Springfield gig, and that kept me going until that ended. And then I went broke. You know, Rick paid me really, really well, but the work kind of ended. My solution for that was actually what brought me in as a studio musician. In the late 80s, there were song demos being made constantly by writers. Mm -hmm. And so you would, I would drive all over town, and I would do a demo for $100 on a song by writers who were... Uh, actually really good writers and the reason these writers wanted me I had played on Crowded House's first record and I had played on Don't Dream It's Over by Crowded House and right. in the 80s in the late 80s from from a songwriter's point of view that was like the best song ever on you know because it was just it's this beautiful unique you know song with great lyrics and because I had played on that I was just I, I, I saved myself financially by doing song demos and it was brutal work to having, you know, if you have three songwriters arguing, arguing over your parts while you're playing, <laughs> it's hard. And then you go do that two or three more times, drive all around town to different publishing studios, different home studios. But I did that for two years. And that actually got my skill level up to the point where I could do stuff quickly. So that's that's a quick tour snapshot through the, the you know, my first uh, few years. Well, a couple of things. I mean, not only did you get your playing skills together, but this sounds like in the networking and social skills, it got your your personality and your business skills together. It did. Uh, you know, it wasn't that hard to do. I mean, in my particular case, sometimes if, you, if you're in a room with new people and you don't reveal your tastes until you find out what theirs are, it can be a benefit because maybe they like, you know, The Clash. The Clash is their favorite band. And maybe you're not particularly a fan of The Clash. Right. You know, I, I mean, I liked Journey. I didn't want to admit the fact that I liked the, the group Journey in certain situations. You know, I really loved Steve Perry and Neil Sean and Journey. But I wasn't going to tell everybody that. If I was in a, a group of people that were more interested in, you know, the Thompson Twins or yeah. whatever, you know, it's just I was really pretty careful about reading the room before I said too much. That's part of it. But it was it was easier, I think, to network because networking was the only way you met people. I mean, it it, it was a much more social, it was like a big university campus. And I, I think with the transition, even before the pandemic, but with the transition to people working on their laptops and in their studios and doing work at home, 
it's just less it's gotten probably harder to meet people so it was there was no magic to it it was it was easy i was a nice guy i was a patient guy i tried really hard well that's that's i think that's a, a whole nother skill to learn i think that's something that's extremely important as you mentioned the entrepreneurial skill base of having these essential skills is to you know you know try to you know it's like relationship cultivation that's what the whole social media is about you did did that you cultivated relationships by being a nice guy by listening you know carefully to what they wanted and delivering what they wanted to make them happy if they're happy they're going to want you back and they're going to recommend you for other things so i think you really kind of found where do you think you learned those skills was that was that a, a you know when you were a kid did you have those skills no i think i think it, it it was when i moved here really and you know truly i enjoyed all the people i was working with and i was frankly impressed with how good everybody was mm -hmm. You know, the, the thing about L.A., and you could say this about where you live, too, it exists on an international level. So the talent and the expertise that are here are not local. They're not regional. They're not national. They're international. And what that means is the best composer from London moves here and the best keyboard player from Paris moves here. Yeah. And, you know, and, and even in Nashville, the, there's a Russian, Ilya, who's the, you know, one of the top acoustic guitar players it lives in nashville so these three cities you know new york la and nashville particularly are international you know magnets for 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 people so the minute you jump in you you have to start to rise to their level i mean when i first got here and i i was playing with guys who were much better at doing sessions than i was guys you know yeah yeah. I had no business being there for some of these sessions. I, you know, it's like, I'm not good enough to be here, but I kind of faked it and I kept my mouth shut and I, I tried really hard and I had some people who were nice to me and they, you know, they gave me, you know, second chances. And, you know, you, I would end up in rooms with Jeff Recaro and, and go, what? Oh my God. You know, I don't even read music hardly. And I have to, you know, it was, Jeff was really nice. I actually got to know him really well, but yeah. uh, so I was in rooms with people who were, who I had seen on records at, in Albuquerque. I was looking at all the records and seeing all the names, and all of a sudden I was in rooms and rehearsal studios adjacent to these people and working with these people, some of them. Yeah. And that that you rise by osmosis. Yeah, yeah. The the the, the way that, that someone elevates not only as a musician but as a business person and just as a as the character that we are. When you're around these people, you mentioned Jeff Porcaro. Jeff was a dear friend. He was would have been my age. And he he really, you know, lifted people in not only conversation, but he lifted people in the sessions. And he, and he really was not a judgmental person. He just wanted the music to be great. And at that moment, deliver, you know, magic. Oh, yeah. I have a couple of good stories. He and I would end up on sessions really early uh, for two reasons. For his reason, because he, he, you know, he would drive out from Hidden Hills, mm -hmm. and in order to beat the traffic, he didn't want that pressure. So, I would literally end up at the studio two hours early. My reason was to make sure my gear was working right, because I was just always so worried about whether I was going to show him the, the, what a big imposter I was. So I get there really early, make sure everything's perfect, it sounds good. Because, you know, when you're in the studio and you're first there, you know, those first few minutes, if there's a technical problem or you have a buzz or whatever, you know, so I would get there and traffic, too. I would get there early, too. So literally, he and I would show up. I remember a, a session at Motown. I think there must have been no traffic. He and I were both there at 9 a.m. for an 11 a.m. session. And so we got to know each other by just because we he showed up early for his reasons and I showed up early for my reasons. And he recommended me to Gary Katz for a session because uh, he kind of liked the way I approach stuff. He recommended me to Marcus Miller for a session. He actually asked me to do his Boss Skaggs record that he was producing, but I was on the road with Al Jarreau and I couldn't do it. It was heartbreaking to me. But the best story, well, two more stories. The best story I have is he he let my stepson sit on a, dr a drum stool next to him for an entire day in the studio because oh. my stepson was a drummer and he was about eight years old at that time. And he sat next to Jeff for an entire day sitting next to him on a drum stool. And then one last story, I was doing a movie date and Jeff didn't tell anybody, but because he was tired, he was working with Herb Alfred all day. He called up Vinny and said, hey, Vinny, man, you gotta go do this session for me. I'm tired, I'm driving home. He didn't even bother to call anybody. He just started driving home and called Vinny and Vinny walks in in place of Jeff as a substitute 
with no notice. And so the composer, Jay Gruska, I don't know if you ever met Jay, but yeah, Jay goes, well, I, 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 I can't really complain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's confidence to just just not even call, not even not do anything. Just drive home and say, Vinny, you got to go do this for me, man. I'm too tired. I can't do this thing. That's so great. It's so great. Well, I think what's amazing is Jeff, Jeff developed an incredible trust and a reputation and an integrity. He had that, you know, he recommended many people for many situations. The fact that you have those memories with him just shows that he trusted you too. I mean, that, that's that's a pretty powerful, you know, in the in the legacy of the music industry, getting Jeff Bacara's trust for the influence that he had. That, that's well, you, but, you know, but you're right about him. It wasn't about him. It was about the music. Yeah. And if he was, if he thought the music needed something other than him, and you know he did this frequently, he would he would say, "I'm not the guy for this." You know, you need to get so and so. You know, absolutely. I mean, he would recommend Keltner or Gad or or, yeah. or, or Bernard Purdy. Yeah. He says, no, you got to go. But Jeff, you can play a shuffle. Yeah, but but that's the Bernard shuffle is what you need. So they fly out Bernard. Yeah. So he really had that ability about himself to to make everybody feel good and do it. Let's go back. You mentioned you took guitar lessons. You had a really good guitar teacher. I want people as they're listening to this interview to know what did you work on in those lessons? Were there specific books? Were there techniques? Were there oh, sure. structuring? What, you know, what was your, 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 your curriculum? Okay, so the, the, a couple of the brilliant things about this guitar teacher, and he, he changed the lives of many, many people. I would go a half hour a week, which was the standard thing then. And he found out exactly where I needed to start. And he found it out, he found out, you know, he, f he found out exactly what I was most interested in. So it was the songs that I loved the most that I was hearing already, the rock songs. Yeah. So he used those songs to find his way in and keep me inspired and teach me. But beyond that, he was very adamant about learning just enough theory to be able to kind of do rock, pop, R&B, soul, country. Yeah. And what that is, is basically the Nashville number system. So he actually taught me the Nashville number system and the theory behind it and the modes I mean, if you're going to play jazz or classical music, that's a different level. But if you're going to play pop, rock, R&B, soul, or country, you don't have to know everything about theory. You just have to know all this modal stuff and basically the way the number system works. And he taught me that. So it was, it was incredible and practical. And then third, he actually had sort of a guidance counselor approach also where he would kind of say so how, how are you doing how, how are things at home you know he was that guy too he was willing yeah. to go there and then he even loaned me an app for my first gig too so he was even generous in that regard too so yeah he, all around he was he was a dream teacher well what a fortunate opportunity for you to have someone like that that really was just you know planted in your life at that early stage. And, you know, when you're going back to the music that you listen to, and I want everyone that's listening, when you mention many of these bands that you listen to, I want them to go back and, and listen to those bands. You know, the music in the 60s was a very diverse kind of music. You know, you heard Sinatra, you heard the Beatles, you heard Elvis. I mean, you heard, you know. Black Old Sabbath. I mean, it, it was it was completely, yeah. everything was wide open and welcome, you know, all on the same format, you know, it's crazy. My gosh, I heard... Dave Brubeck Quartet in the early 60s playing Take Five. And that's right. when I fell in love with that band, then fell in love with Morello to seek him out, eventually to take lessons with him. So it was like you heard a jazz song in 5-4 with a drum solo in it on AM radio. That It really shaped us for, for what we did. Absolutely. It was uh, wide open and so diverse. Uh, I, I feel very, very lucky that I am the age I'm at, and I was born when I was born, and I saw what I saw. I mean, it is more difficult for new musicians to navigate the the you know the 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 equation of making a living in this business. Uh, but it's also we're post some of the greatest music ever made. So you know, I I would never say that our music was better than the new music, but I feel very lucky that yeah. I was there at that moment in time. It was kind of interesting. I, I mean, j just talk about the, the business side of what, of how you organize all this. How did you, how did you keep track of the sessions? You know, you know did, did you, and even like you said, if there was no job on New Year's Eve, you hustled to find, you know, where you could work. I mean, that, that's a, that's a real dedication to the passion of wanting to play music. 
Okay, so yeah, I, I've kind of, uh, you're kind of reminding me what it was like after I moved here and I got really busy doing sessions. Um, there was a time, I mean, there, there, I had a big heyday in the 90s and a big heyday in the 2000s too. I did in maybe from 2000 to 2012 or 2000, you know, maybe for about 15 years. I mean, well, we, I did go 12 years without taking a vacation, maybe from 2003 to 2015. Yeah. Uh, and, but the reason for that is this, and this is a hard thing. Um, I had to be available to everybody who called me 100% of the time because I didn't want to lose my slot. I didn't want them to fall in love with the other guy. So you protect your corner by being available 100% of the time. That means you never go on vacation and you work weekends. Then there was a period where I was working with a, a really great guy, Rob Cavallo, and we would do these big projects. And he liked to, everybody to camp out and work long hours. So I would work with him every day from two to midnight. And then I do all my regular car clients in the morning and on the weekends. So there were lots of seven day weeks. So part of it was saying yes to everybody. The great thing about having a home studio and being a guitar player, guitar uh, often would be overdubbed later in the process. So, and this pertains to business and there's lots of other things I can say. When I established my home studio, which was probably around the year 2000, I flipped the paradigm to where I became like a doctor and I started to tell people, oh, I can see you on Thursday. Oh, I can see you Friday morning at 10. So I didn't lose work because of scheduling because that's one of the most excruciating things. And you know this, you've been through this. Yeah. You have a gig, the, the best gig in the world comes along at the same moment and you have to turn that down. They're both the best gigs in the world. That The, the, the home studio actually did away with that because I could literally say, okay, I can see you Monday at two. I can see you, you know, Tuesday at 10. Yeah. But even on a deeper level, I began to negotiate time. So if two people wanted to work at the same time and I wanted to do both the gigs, I would call the person who I'd already taken the gig with and judge the level of discomfort in their voice mm. when I asked them if they could change it. Yeah. Literally, you know, having a heart to heart, hey, you know, I is there any way we can change that 10 a.m. on Friday? Because I, you know, I have this other thing and I, I, you know, and, and, and if they go, oh yeah, no problem, then you're, you're gold. And then, but then if they go, well, it's, it's, uh, I don't know if I, then you go, okay, I don't want, I don't, you know, I'm not going to, then you go back to the other side and you do the same thing. So this pertains to your question. This is business. Yeah. This is now, think if I had an agent or manager or whatever, I'd be dead. You know, they would ruin this in a minute. So literally I would, I would, judge the discomfort in their response to my request to make them shift and move and i would work with that and sometimes you couldn't do them both at the same time but usually one of the people could shift and move mm -hmm. now there is one story that i have that, and i'll wrap this up <laughs> so scheduling finesse in scheduling was you know one of my one of the things i got really really good at uh the other thing is I wrote every session down because it is a mountain to climb to actually collect money money after you do the gig. So yeah. you write down the date and the amount, wait four weeks, and then sometimes you start from scratch because they haven't even heard of you. Yeah. You call an office and sometimes, you know, it's sometimes you would have to give them four weeks just out of courtesy and then they go, what, who are you? What did you do and how, why are we paying you? And you give them the backstory and everything and then you start the process. So there was that, that was, you know, sometimes it took weeks or months to get paid and you know, especially from some of the major record companies, which is another story. And you got to keep but track. Yeah. With regards to scheduling, my friend Rob Cavallo, he's such a great guy, and and my big one of my biggest producers that I worked with. So he got, you know, he's famous for for producing a Green Day and the, and the Goo Goo Dolls, which I played on. But he was always an executive, so he got the gig as chairman of Warner Brothers Records at a certain point. He hired me to do a Shine Down record. They're they're a metal band. Great guys. We did yeah. the first one and it, went, and it went platinum and he hired me to do the second one. And I said, great, uh, but I'm over at Sunset Sound with Jason Mraz on those days. Can I show up late every day? And he's going, well, I really want you to bond with these. No, I didn't even ask that. I said, I said, Rob, let me skip the tracking. I'll just show up for overdubs because I'm doing Jason Mraz. And he says, no, 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 no. I want you to bond with these guys. It's really important. <laughs> and at this point, I'm talking to my friend Rob, but I'm also talking to the chairman of Warner Brothers Records. You know, it's like, I, it's, 
but we're, you know, we know she's a really good guy and we know each other. And, and so I, I go, okay, okay, okay. So how about if I show up at three o'clock every day, I'll work from 10 to two for Jason in the morning at Sunset Sound. And I'll literally walk the six blocks down the road to Ocean Way and start with Shine Down at 3 p.m. Will that work? And he goes, yeah, that'll work. And I knew at that point that I was not going to be showing up at three o'clock. Yeah. I knew it. Yeah. Yeah. And the first day, I show up at 7 p.m. Oh. I say, hey, Rob, how's it going? He says, great. <laughs> And Show up the next day at 7 p.m. Hey, how's it going? Great. <laughs> Want dinner? <laughs> I knew I could actually push him that far and show up four hours later than I had promised and he'd be okay with it. You know, because he doesn't, you know, he, he I knew he was starting at two or three and they, they could work without me for a few hours. So that's the, that was the, my biggest example of, Uh, pushing both ends against the middle and everybody was supportive and a friend and kind you know this happens to musicians all the time and and uh, most of the people you work with are really willing to try and accommodate you as best they can but this really is about about a you're a compassionate person so you're aware of their feelings and and, and what what they need but this is also a real lesson in psychology you know we have to have that understanding of human nature to find the balance of how to just get along and make these things work you yes. seem to have that naturally. <laughs> well, I have a lot of empathy for people, and that that ha- can come at great cost. But um, I also get really close to a lot of people I work with, so I end up healing, you know, becoming their friends, and we end up spending time together. But it's true. I tried to turn everybody kind of into family, and yeah. I got the same treatment back from them. So, yeah, the scheduling thing was really, really took a lot of finesse, and the home studio just made it so easy and so wonderful. So how did how did you balance family now in this and, and, and relationships and all that? Because you're saying the dedication the amount of time, you were 24-7, yeah. five days out of, the, out, of, out of the year. That's intense. How did you, how'd you find that to... to uh, that? Luckily, my wife was loyal, even though I ignored her a lot. Now, this is, a, this is something I would not recommend, and I, don't, I wouldn't do it again if I had it, to do it again. But she understood that in order for us to, to make it in the world... Uh, these kind of sacrifices would need to be made. So she was willing to wait. Yeah. Now, we did have some nice vacations and we got to do some nice stuff. But the the problem was if I made a promise that I would be there on a Sunday, I often broke that promise. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing good about that. I, I think it's the luck of the draw. I had a, a wife who was willing to understand that this was a sacrifice that was a season of life that wouldn't last forever. I mean, now... We're together all the time. It's incredible, you know. So we travel together. It's wonderful. But you had to wait for that. So it, it I wouldn't recommend it. I know lots of, it's purely the luck, luck of the draw that she didn't, you know, get fed up and, and leave. But so I lucked out there. It's, well, you that's, know. Well, that's, that's the patience of a team. That's the yeah. teamwork. And, and that's right. the sacrifice that comes with it. It's the line of business that you're in. It wasn't a nine to five. You weren't selling insurance, but you were home at 5, 15 every day every day. So that's a part of the process of, of how we have to learn as individuals to deal with sometimes these regrets and these challenges that come up in life. Well, and think about this, uh, a really, really good doctor is, you know, he, 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 he takes the, you know, he's, he's out to dinner with his wife and he gets a, a call and he leaves and goes to the hospital. You know, yeah. it's, it's really no different than that. So it's not unprecedented out in the world for other jobs, but it requires a, um, a stroke of luck, I think, in your partner, you know, to have somebody who's willing to wait. So now with the insanity of the pandemic and this home studio that you have, you know, you've been able to schedule things and have a little bit more time to to organize your life in a little different way than how it was probably pre-pandemic. Well, the, the missing piece of our conversation is about 12 years ago, I discovered some people who were teaching online and, and make, you know, having kind of big businesses with it. And I thought, well, that's actually a great way for me to, great direction for me to go for the next chapter of my life because, you know, budgets were shrinking and there is a, a thing that happens, and, you know, unless you're somebody like Vinnie Caliuta or you can think of a few other of our, you know, superstar friends. Yeah. 
there is a, a little bit of aging out that happens in in that the, the artists they want, might want to see somebody who looks like one of their friends rather than somebody that looks like their dad playing. Right. That's really not the truth because most young people really, really consider you a treasure when you've had this kind of experience. So I, I'm not saying that most young people really, really are appreciative of having, you know, someone my age in the room with my experience. However, 10 years ago, I thought, you know, there's an arc to this thing. Even if budgets weren't shrinking, there's an arc to this thing that's just inevitable. So I, I'd like to try this teaching business. So I started 12 years ago and uh, started building my YouTube channel. And then about six years ago, I monetized I hired my stepson full time to be my film editor, and we, we created a membership. I debuted it with a hundred videos, and now I have a a membership site with over sixteen hundred videos, over like one hundred and thirty hours of content. I add to it. I've got four employees, and four thousand paying members. Um, the YouTube channel is a, a way to keep eyeballs coming back to that. It's been a really really nice thing, and it's it's been nice because it's a product rather than a service. So you'll understand this. I spent my entire life in client service, which meant I sat there in the chair and delivered at my highest level uh, to get paid to work for artists and musicians and producers and engineers. Now I've made a product that sells without me being there. Now I have to work on that product. I have to work behind the scenes and I do customer service and I keep adding to it and I promote it. But I don't have to be there to earn the money because it's a product. So it's it's a nice thing at this point in time to have uh, a product rather than a service that earns money. The studio has turned into that more. I now do sessions for what I call family and friends. I do them for people that I want to do them for. I don't take every session anymore. Uh, I've got a couple of friends I recommend. Uh, a, a friend named Andrew Sinewick, who's an amazing guitar player who I send people to when I get asked for sessions. But I turned down a fair amount of sessions at this point because the other business is so satisfying and so fun. And uh, it's a better equation moving forward. So that's kind of the truth about where I'm at right now. But the family and friends thing still holds. And I actually, last spring, I did 30 songs with Bob Dylan and Don Was, which was really, really fun. So those things crop up occasionally. Um, and I'm still open to those, but I don't seek session work anymore. I just, I just do little, little, uh, you know, appearances for friends. Well, I think you've, you've, you've laid down, you know, breadcrumbs through the course of your life where people know how to find you for, right. for right. what they want. So you've done enough, enough right. work. Just talk about the, uh, the talk about the masterclass. So just, just kind of explain how that all works. Well, what what people do, they they can either join monthly or yearly. I try and and suggest the yearly one because it's less expensive and I want you know I want people who are going to make that commitment but it's really intermediate guitar it's if you if you know all of these websites and and it would be the same for you too it's people that want to learn to play up to your your level and who you are I'm not Steve Vai I'm not Ingve Malmsteen you know I'm not uh, Pat Metheny but if you want to learn to play the way I play and you're halfway there, it's perfect for you. It's basically intermediate at any level. I just finished the beginnings of a beginner course. In the last couple of months, I filmed about 85 beginner videos, and I'm gonna start, I'm gonna publish those as part of the masterclass so that I can start bringing in beginners in the future. I, oddly, I wasn't a good enough teacher 10 years ago to teach beginning guitar. I, it's, I, it, I'm, I had to wait, but um, it's basically, you know, a, a membership where you, you know, you have tabs and jam tracks and it's not the most organized, you know, you kind of have to s search for your own curriculum within it. The, the key for me is I offer a two week free trial so that people can know exactly what they're getting before they pay. And if somebody wants a refund, we give it no questions asked. I mean, it's, 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 uh, my, my policy is that everybody's happy no matter what, whether they stay or they go. Well, it, it obviously works because in the drumming world, as I do the same thing, the, uh, I hear people involved with it with what you're doing and they are really inspired it's very clear what you're teaching them they understand it and they can apply it immediately to the joy and the passion of what they're willing to learn what the, and what they want to learn i would hope so you know for me it's ensemble playing that's same for you because you're a drummer it's it's yeah. you're you're meant to be there with the other cats you know absolutely and as a guitar yeah. player that's always how i felt too so it's a part that that works in a song in a perform in a musical context yeah, yeah. everything is for me is about being in a musical context
Yeah. Well, that's that's really good for the the world that we grew up with. When we speak about the the sixties and seventies and all the great music at that time, then eventually into the eighties, there was just such great music written then, and it was so such beautiful music as far as the form, the melodies, the words, all of it kind of encapsulated those few decades. That to this day now. There are still many students here now, we're in the 21st century, that are putting bands together that are from bands of the 20th century. So, so true. So true. It, it really, all these, all these, you know, these, these, these bands that they're putting together, it's just so great to see that they're going back to hear that music and learn great foundational music. It's true. I mean, and, and uh, you know, my favorite record of all time is Wichita Lineman by Glenn Campbell. Yeah. And it's because of Jimmy Webb and those chords and that orchestra yeah. and you know it's just so and but and then some people for you it might be something different for you know but for me i i really love songs and you know it's it's so great that kids you know kids these days love the beatles they love the old music too i mean yeah. there was an article in the atlantic i don't know if you caught it a couple of weeks ago where on spotify uh, uh, Catalog, old music is the majority of Spotify listeners. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's like 95% of what's listened to on Spotify is legacy stuff. Hey, I, my, my three boys, that's all they listen to. My, my, they're yeah. in their mid-20s, and they, they just go back and go back. And when I hear them pull songs out that they like, I'll say, oh, my gosh, I remember when that song came out. <laughs> I said, well, Dad, it's great. Check out what's happening with it. So it's great to see that enthusiasm. Let's talk about the, this youthful concept of social media, the, the, the necessary needs of social media, and you having the YouTube channel. How do you maintain all of that, and how do you keep it going? Well, in my case, I have a small footprint and uh, my friends in the space, like Rick Beato is a really good friend of mine. And Rick, there are other people who who post a lot more. They work a lot harder, a lot more hours. I do just enough to keep my YouTube footprint healthy and sometimes a little more than that. Um, I generally get about 500,000 views a month. Uh, so that's 15 to 20,000 views a day day but i've been up to like eight hundred thousand views in the last month just by some lucky videos that did, did well and by publishing a few more extra videos so I, I have pushed a little further but i only release on youtube three to five videos a month mm -hmm. um and a couple of those are often live streamed which are really exciting it's so exciting to do a live youtube video it's 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 harrowing it's scary but it's so exciting too but I just do enough to keep it uh, serviced. I used to be on Instagram, but I just don't have the time for it or the energy and I don't get enough back from it. I look at TikTok and I go, I cannot, I cannot do this one. It's just, it's so I, I only do what I need to do to keep my YouTube audience. And for now that works, that may change. Yeah, you know, right. these things are never etched in stone. Right. Now, for a young musician, Instagram is good because it's your literally, literally your business card, and maybe that's shifting to TikTok. It's t TikTok is essentially the same; it's just short, you know, short videos. Yeah, yeah. So if if you're if you're talking about social media for a young musician, it's essential, but I don't think you have to make it your whole life, and that is the key, is because it is, it's so draining and so relentless, and no matter what you give it, it wants more. So. Right. You have to be able to go, okay, I did a post on Monday. I'm not going to do another one until next Monday. And it's hard to do because people are in the space that you know are posting <laughs> and posting and posting. So you have to be, if you're an introvert, you have to pretend to be an extrovert. <laughs> and that's kind of what I do. So maybe uh, I've become more of an extrovert. And if you're, so you have to be an entrepreneur and, and pretend to be an extrovert and you have to have content up there. My, my, you know, my little vignette that I tell musicians, if, if you have an Instagram that has just a few videos, but you're proud of them, they represent you in, in the right way. You know, if Bruno Mars is on his private jet looking for a guitar player and they give him your name, he's going to, he's going to click on media. And if you're on Instagram and he looks at one video and goes, yeah, get that guy. Yeah. That's how it's going to happen. Right. So it's your business card or YouTube, you know, whatever. Right. It literally, whatever people click on, on whatever device they're on and immediately get to when they put your name in, you need to be represented there and represented well. So 
Yeah. So this younger generation really needs to be involved in Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and Twitter. You know, I mean, they, they need to be really they have the hand in everything if they as they're developing their career in an early stage. Well, I would say pick the one that seems most relevant at the particular time, because I'm not even logged into Facebook. Uh, I, I don't even do that one. I don't think Facebook is necessary anymore, but Instagram is still necessary. TikTok is all anybody talks about. I mean, I think at this point it's TikTok, but for a hiring hiring musicians, I'm not sure. I would say it could be any of those things or it could just be one of those things, right. but the young person is gonna know better than you and I what people are looking at and what where all the heat is, you know? Yeah. You know, YouTube is very mature, it, but the thing about YouTube is it's a learning. It's like an encyclopedia. Yeah, really. So for what I do teaching, it's the right place, you know. What motivates you? I have a sense of gratitude about being able to do what I want, you know, and I'm looking at your studio, realizing you have the same ability I do. You're doing what you want. Yeah. Uh, a gratitude about being able to actually make a living with a product rather than a service right now after being in client service forever and after breaking every promise and working every weekend. So now I can actually take a nap in the afternoon and uh, take a week off if I want because the business is functioning with or without me, you know, because it's a video collection. Now I, I do work hard on it and I, I do always, you know, I'm always making videos, but the, the work is on my terms and the work is uh, gentle and, and I don't have as much energy as I used to, so it kind of suits me perfectly at this point. But back to your question, what motivates me? At this point, it's my love of music yeah. and my love of simple guitar playing, you know. <laughs> I think I think you're probably the same way. I mean, I, I'm not trying to stroke you or, or score I, points I, or anything. I, I'm totally there with you, Tim. That's yeah. exactly where it's at. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and a part of it is the, the era that we grew up in and, and how we've evolved and the insanity of all the traveling we've done. All of that kind of shapes us to a certain degree where, look with myself, same thing, where I'm teaching out of my studio and I'm having a great, great time. I'm totally in control of my life. And if I want to take a couple of days off and go with my wife somewhere, I just don't schedule those days and we go. And in, in, in the middle of the week or or when, when you know, we, I don't care about, you know, when, even when my boys were younger, I, I pulled them out of school because I was going to the NAMM show and I wanted to bring them with me. So I pulled them out of, and we took a week off and hung out at California, Disneyland, and, and had uh, a great time. And it was just, totally enjoyed ourselves. So we have to work hard for that level of freedom, which you obviously have. And your work ethic is really at a, at a high level, which is such an important quality for this young generation to have. But in closing, one more question. What would you say to this young generation? They're there, they're passionate, they want to make a career in this industry, they want to really kind of get out there and show the world who they are. What would you say to that, that you know, starry-eyed student? I would say that do everything you can as well as you can and be open to kind of shape-shifting in your role as a musician. Maybe you'll play in the background for somebody. Maybe you'll write a little commercial that you'll get a fee for. Yeah. Maybe you'll write co-write a song with a singer that will end up getting licensed in a film. You know, maybe you'll do some weekend corporate event where you're doing covers and you put on a wig and you're, you know, a, <laughs> you know, a, a Van Halen tribute band. I'm talking about every different kind of income stream you can find, everything you can do. I learned to program drums so that you can write beats that can end up getting, you know, you'll be one of the seven writers on a song because your beat is the beat they had to have. You know, I'm saying learn the technology, learn to sing, learn to write, learn to play, take all kinds of gigs. I think it's more of a global thing. Yeah. And then, of course, meet as many people as you can. I mean, the world is about to open up for real. And, you know, any kind of event, you know, on the on Instagram, there's this association called Jam Card, where they they started having these events before the pandemic, people showing up, people and and those kinds of things. Social media is fostering all of these actual real social events. Yeah, be part of those. Go to gigs, meet people, meet people, meet people. You'll do it. You'll make a living. And look for and and certainly, I mean, never be afraid to teach because I am an evangelist for if you're a good player. 
and you make a three-hour tutorial on learning how to play something, and it's hosted somewhere, and there's a link to it and a price, you can sell that at your gigs. You can, yeah. you know, so teaching, I mean, teaching for me has been wonderful. It's a, it's a wonderful, um, you know, it's a real business, and it does really well. And, and so that's a part of it, too, you know. I mean, musicians have always taught famous, famous musicians, you know. Yeah. Uh, so never rule that out. Just, you know, do everything. <laughs> well, how, I met a young guitar player study, learning classical guitar, and he studied with Andre Segovia. I mean, That's what I'm just, talking about. That, I was looking for an example. I didn't have one, and you gave me and, one. That's great. And, and there it is. And he studied with Andre Segovia. It, it didn't get any bigger in the classical field than Andre Segovia. So that was so great to hear because of that Pablo Casals taught. I mean, you know, Yo-Yo Mai. Taught. So all these guys are still involved with it. So that's part of the sharing. Well, that is fantastic you're doing this, Tim. And, and again, the Masterclass series, I want everyone who's listening to go there and check it out and, uh, and be a part of what uh, Tim is doing. Yeah, it's easy. The links are everywhere uh, under every YouTube video. And if you Google, Google me, it comes right up. So it's, it's all there. Fantastic. Tim, I thank you so much. Now, on behalf of the Artist Series and the Sessions panel, it's great to have you here. What you have shared is going to help people for generations to come. I thank you so much. I look forward to getting together with you at some point, especially when I get out to the West Coast again and uh, we get past all this craziness. I look forward to sitting down and uh, touching base. Uh, please, please come over, come to the studio. Or I'll meet you somewhere. Can't wait to do it. All right. Thanks so much. Take care. Tim, thank you so much. Stay well. Keep doing what you're doing. Now I'm Fabio here at the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible to support. You're giving us a great The Sessions panel. We'll see you real soon.